We're starting into a new series today, and I wanted to ask this question right at the very start, and, and because I don't like being alone. Anybody else not like being alone? He's all like being alone. I know there's a couple of his, maybe, maybe, I hope so, a couple of his that don't like being alone, and I don't like being alone when I uh, admit to something. Uh, and what I'm admitting to this morning is that it's, it's, it's so easy when we come in here to church on a Sunday morning, isn't it so easy to be a Christian? Anybody find it easy to be a Christian this morning? It's easy to be a Christian because we're surrounded by other Christians, isn't it? Yeah, it, it, it's so easy to be a Christian when we're surrounded by other Christians, but uh, is anybody else like me and Monday comes after Sunday and you find on Monday and maybe even Tuesday and Wednesday, Thursday, Friday and Saturday, it's not so easy to be a Christian the rest of those days, isn't it? Well, it's so easy to be a Christian when we're in here singing, you know, I will sing of the goodness of God. Isn't that so easy when we're all worshiping together and praising together, but then Monday comes and it's, it's not so easy maybe on a Monday to sing of the goodness of God. Maybe when you go back into work and, and that guy in work or that, that woman in work who's been annoying you for the last 10 years is there still and you, you walk into work after, you know, have a great Sunday and, oh, there they are again. Oh, I have to deal with you again this week, or, or the boss that you don't like, or, or maybe you just don't like your job, and when you get into, into work on Monday, you're like, oh, here we go again, you know, and we find that it's not so easy to be a Christian on Monday, and what I want to talk to you today about, and for the next few weeks, is, is how we as Christians, we need to develop a little bit of a cultural resistance, amen? Cultural resistance. Romans chapter 12 and verse 2 it says that we are not to be conformed to this world. I love the way the Phillips version puts it. It says, don't let the world around you squeeze you into its own mold. Don't let the world around you squeeze you into your own mold. You know what it's like to be a Christian sometimes living in the world? It seems like the world is going one direction and you're going the opposite direction. You're going against the flow. You know what I'm saying? It's like sometimes uh, uh, the world is going this direction and it, the constant pressure on you is to go with the world, to go and do as the world does. You know, like when you, uh, you, you accidentally start to walk up the down escalator in the shopping center. You know, you're, you, everyone is coming down, but you're trying to go up. You know, uh, that's what it feels like sometimes uh, in, in the world that we live in. We, as Christians, we're, we, we determine on Sunday, oh, I'm going to stand out this week in work. I'm going to stand out in school this week or in my college. I'm going to stand out with my family this week. But then we get back into work, get back into school and college, and we find that it's like we're pushing and kicking against the goals, as, as Paul says. We're, we're constantly being pushed in the direction that the world wants us to go in. So today... And for the next few weeks, we're going to talk about how we can live distinctively as Christians Monday through Sunday. And I think one of the Bible characters that we have and back in the Old Testament who nails this is Daniel. Daniel nails it, I think. We're going to talk about him today. I want to give you a little bit of a backstory about Daniel, just in case you didn't know Daniel was a Jew and he lived in Jerusalem and... Uh, Babylon was the powerhouse in their area. They were the most powerful nation in their area. And Babylon were going all across their area. And they were conquering all the nations of their area. And, and at this time, Israel became uh, their next target. And Babylon rolled into Israel. And eventually, after a while, they conquered Israel. And, and instead of them, uh, when they conquered an area, instead of them wiping out all of the inhabitants of the area, what they actually did is they captured all the youngest and the brightest and the leaders and the future leaders of tomorrow and they captured them and they brought them back to Babylon. Uh, and their, their reason in, in doing this is because they didn't just want to roll into an area and capture that area and then stick their flag in the ground and say it was ours and for the next two centuries have struggles and battles and wars against uh, those people who would rise up still against them. What they wanted to do is they wanted to roll in there, and they wanted to assimilate the people of the land into their culture. So what they did in, in, in Daniel's day is they, they, when they conquered Israel, they took 4,600 of the young 
Jewish men of the day, the leaders of tomorrow, and they captured every one of them and they brought them all back to Babylon with the plan, here's what we're going to do. We're going to assimilate these young men into our culture. They're going to think like us, speak like us, believe like us, dress like us, and then eventually we're going to send them back when they are like us. We'll send them back into the country they came from and then they will rule that country like what we would rule it. And in doing that, they will be able to take over the whole place. That was their plan. And that's where Daniel finds himself in this situation. He is surrounded by a culture that is absolutely not normal for him to have faith in his God. But because of his love of God and his dedication to God, he was able to stand up and to stand out even though he was surrounded by unbelievers trying to assimilate him into the culture of where they had brought him. And if you read the story of Daniel, and I encourage you to do so, you will see that for the next 70 years, through four different regime changes, four different kings, Daniel stood by his trust and his faith in God. And amazingly, everyone around him, from co-workers to kings, came to acknowledge Daniel's one and only true living God. I believe that we are called to be Daniels in our day. And I know what you're thinking this morning. I could never be as bold as Daniel. I could never do what Daniel did. So how did he do it? How was Daniel able to resist the relentless Babylonian environment constantly pushing against him and against his faith in God? Well, there's three things that Daniel did. And the first thing that Daniel did in his quest to avoid being assimilated into the Babylonian culture was he made a plan. He made a plan. Isn't it good to make plans? You know, if you're ever going on your holidays and you don't make a plan, what do you do when you land in the airport or wherever you're going? You just stand there and go, what next? What do I do next? We all have to make plans in our lives, in our education, when we decide that, you know what, I, I want to go to college or I, I want to further my education. You've got to make a plan. Nobody just turns up in the, uni in the university on day one and says, okay, what am I going to do? For months, maybe even years before that, they've been thinking about what I'd like to study, what I would like to be when I grow up. We've got to make plans. And Daniel being surrounded by this ungodly nation, trying to turn him into a Babylonian, he decided, in order for me to succeed in preserving my faith in God and my, my love of God and my worship of God, I have got to make a plan. Amen? He made a plan. Let's read this. Daniel chapter 1, verse 3. We'll start from there. He says, And then the king ordered Asphanes, the chief of his court officials to bring into the king's service some of the Israelis from the royal family and the nobility. Young men, without any physical defect, handsome, showing aptitude for every kind of learning, well-informed, quick to understand, and qualified to serve in the king's palace. These were the young men that he captured from Israel. These are the, that's the attributes that he was looking for. And he brought all these back into Babylon so he could assimilate them into the culture. Let's keep reading. He says, he, uh, he was to teach them the language and the literature of the Babylonians. The king assigned them a daily amount of food and wine from the king's table. They were to be trained for three years, and after that they were to enter the king's service. Among those chosen were some from Judah, were Daniel, Hananiah, Mishalak, and Azariah. The, uh, the chief official gave them new names to Daniel, he gave, gave Belteshazzar to Hananiah, Shadrach. To Mishalai, he gave Mishalak. And to Azariah, he gave Ab Aben... <laughs> I've said a lot of hard names there, so you give me a break on this one. <laughs> Abendigo, praise the Lord. <laughs> uh, praise God. So King Nebuchadnezzar's plan was to make them speak the language of the Babylonians, to dress the same way as the Babylonians, to be assimilated into the culture of the Babylonians, to learn the, the history of the Babylonians and the ethos of the Babylonians. 
He was going to make him eat the food of the Babylonians, and he was going to change their names. And he was going to assimilate them into Babylonian culture. Now, the name change thing. Ordinarily, you'd say that's not a big deal, is it? And many of us here, when we, when we went to school or when we went to our jobs, people gave us a nickname. They called us by something that they might think that they might find it easier to remember your name by. I know many of us have been in that situation. But changing a name for a, a Jewish follower of God was a big deal. It was a big deal. The name Daniel means God is my judge. And now the king decides that I'm going to call Daniel, not Daniel anymore, God is my judge. I'm going to call him Belteshazzar. Belteshazzar. <laughs> Belteshazzar. Which was interpreted to mean, I'm not going to say that anymore. Now that's, that's one and done, two and done on that one. Which means Baal protect the king. Or may Baal protect his life. You know who Baal was? Baal was a pagan demonic god of their days. One of the gods that the Babylonians worshipped. So what basically the king was wanting to call Daniel, he was wanting to call Daniel, may Baal protect the king. This was an all-out assault on who Daniel is. Every part of who Daniel is was being attacked by the king. And I want you to notice that the same strategies are happening all around us today in our lives. We need to be very aware that we have a spiritual enemy. Amen? And it's his plan to try and assimilate each and every one of us into the culture of today. Now, who controls the culture of today? It's not God. God is not the one controlling the culture of today. The enemy is. He is the one that is pushing back against our God worship. He is the one that wants to take our worship from us. He wants to take our relationship with our God from us. He is the one constantly pushing back on who God wants us to be. And we need to be aware of that because he does it very subtly. Amen? The enemy is not out there putting up big signs saying, come my way, follow me, do my thing. Amen? But that's the way of the world. That's the way the world wants you to go. He wants you to follow in his ways. Do, do his things. Push against the things of God in our lives. For example, and I could give you dozens of examples this morning of things that we experience now today in our day-to-day -day world that are not from God, that are from the enemy, pushing it back against our Christian culture. But some of the things that you may be aware of and some of the things that you may not be aware of, and I'm trying to be very sensitive today, but the enemy is subtle. And I know that many Christians today practice yoga. But yoga is not a Christian practice. Amen? we just got to be honest about this. Yoga is not a Christian practice. Now, I'm not against stretching. Don't get me wrong. Stretching is good, Amen? you can't touch your toes, praise God. Maybe you need to do some more stretching. I can't. Praise God. <laughs> but we need, to, we need to do that kind of thing. Amen? But yoga is, is of the enemy because it, it is an Eastern religion. It's an Eastern practice. I'm not against stretching. I'm not against breathing techniques and, and, and learning to be able to calm ourselves down, and I'm not, I'm not against that sort of thing, but we've got to be very aware of the roots of yoga, and they are from Hinduism, and they are from Buddhism. Yoga originated as a spiritual practice in India, and the aim of yoga is to unite the practitioner's individual consciousness with universal consciousness. Yoga is a form of worship of the Hindu gods. I can't put that any plainer than that. It is. That's what it is. And I know Christians are being, are being conned. They are being drawn into that kind of stuff because someone says, 
told him that, oh, it's great for your joints, it's great for your muscles, it's great for your breathing, and it helps you get at peace. And, and they've been drawn into that kind of stuff just because someone tried to dress this thing up as something that it's not. Amen? You can put a, 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 a pig in a sheep's wool, and it'll still be a pig. Amen? And that's the way that they are dressing up these kind of things. Reiki is another huge one. Huge one. That's been around for years. And I've known many Christians who, who thought that, oh, Reiki is okay. But Reiki is not okay. Reiki is another thing that they use crystals to channel your energy within your body, proclaiming that it brings healing to your body. It's not. It is a religious practice that people are just saying today, oh, this is just something that we do today. It's not. I know many Christians, too, they have little Buddhas in their back gardens. Oh, it's just a garden ornament. No, it's not. Buddha is a religious worship statue for Hindus. Simple as that. Is uh, There's a garden center down in Wexford. I took a picture of it the other day. I meant to put it into the PowerPoint, but it, they have a huge Buddha down there. It's massive. It's definitely two meters tall and, and a meter and a half wide. It is massive. Don't tell me that that's just a garden ornament. It's not. It's a subtle way the enemy has to bring ungodly practices into your home, into your lives. And we need to be careful of those things. Amen? Here's what Peter said, talking about the deceptiveness of our enemy. In 1 Peter 5, 8, he said, Be alert and of sober mind. Your enemy, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion, seeking someone to devour. We have a spiritual enemy. And he is out to destroy the God worship in you. And he does it by a process of assimilating you. Getting you to a place where you're doing all of these things that are so ungodly, so part of, an, of another uh, ungodly worship practice. And, and you wake up some morning and you realize, wow, I've, I've gone so far into this whole thing. It's a slow process of deception and, ass and assimilation. like death by a thousand cuts. Church, if you're not anchored to Jesus, you will fall for anything. We need to anchor ourselves to Jesus. We need to stay, stay as close to Jesus as we can. And if we stay close to Jesus, then we will not fall for any of that kind of stuff. Amen? Ephesians chapter 4 and verse 14 says that we should no longer be children, tossed to and fro and carried about by every wind of doctrine, by the trickery of men and by the cunning craftiness of deceitful plotting. The enemy is crafty, and he has so many tricks in his armory. He's crafty. He's sly. He's smart. Don't think he's not smart. He's smart to draw people, to draw nations, to draw the whole world over to his side. Even, they don't even know it. They don't even know it. Paul warns us to, to grow up Get close to God. Stop falling for every trick of the enemy. I've seen so many people who've allowed their church attendance to become optional. Some that have stopped going to church altogether, being drawn into what they describe as different expressions of spirituality, believing that all spirituality points in the right direction. It does not. It doesn't. Amen? See, the enemy doesn't mind us singing the goodness of God in here on a Sunday. It's out there in the world, outside of the church, when we get back into our jobs, into our, into our lives, schools and colleges, into what we do. It's that he's trying to stop us to declare the goodness of God out there. So Nebuchadnezzar has a plan to make them speak the language of the Babylonians, to make them wear the clothes of the Babylonians, to learn the, the languages of the Babylonians and the culture of the Babylonians, to eat their food and change their names, but Daniel, he also had a plan. Hey, listen, I'm not naive enough to say that we don't live in this world, praise God. Wouldn't it be great if you could just, you know, keep yourself from the world? But we can't, amen. We can't. And that's as true today as it was back in Jesus' day. 
we got to live in this world, amen? But we don't have to be of this world, amen? Daniel had a plan. But all of this stuff that he knew that the king was about to try and force him to do, he, he made a plan. Verse 8 said, Daniel resolved not to defile himself with the royal food and wine. Daniel determined. He decided, I made up my mind, I'm not doing this. Not going to happen. Even though he may be in a foreign nation against his will, the king of that nation may have been trying to change his clothes, his language, even his name. But Daniel drew a line when it came to what he was going to eat. Daniel determined under no circumstances am I going to eat the food of the Babylonians. The word of God says that we are to be in this world but not of this world. Daniel's refusal to eat the food of the Babylonians stood him out from the rest of his captives. Verse 8 continues and he says, And he, Daniel, asked the chief official for permission not to defile himself in this way. You see, Daniel had food customs from his, from his uh, Jewish religion that didn't allow him to eat the stuff that the Babylonians wanted him to eat, i.e. meat that had been sacrificed to idols. And I love the way that Daniel didn't just complain to his friends or anyone who would listen to him. He resolved that he, wa he wasn't going to eat their food. And he brought his request directly to the chief priest who had rule over him. I worked with many Christians in the past who, who have been rostered to work Sundays and who have been going on about how much they love God and how much they, they were not going to work Sundays. And listen, don't get me wrong, I know the world that we live in today, some people are forced into work Sundays. I, I understand that, totally do. But in the job that I was in, you weren't. And when people were being rostered to work Sundays, they had an option. They could have said it. They could have, but they gave out. They whinged, they moaned, they, they said, oh, my constitutional right is to allow me to practice my religion, but they never said anything to the boss. They just turned up and, and worked. And after a number of years, my contract got changed for the better, but one of the stipulations of this new contract change was that I would have to work on a Sunday, one in every six. And straight away when I signed that contract, I said I will not work on Sunday mornings. I will not work on a Sunday mornings, and I never did. Never worked on a Sunday morning. I started to work at 2 o'clock. I worked a graveyard shift. I didn't care. But that allowed me to continue to go to church. If there's an option there, we should always take it. Amen? Don't just complain. Don't just growl about it to your fellow workmates. Do something about it. Amen? Trust God for wisdom in that conversation. Have that conversation. Trust God that He'll make a way. Amen? Because He makes a way. If you have to work Sunday evening, that's fine. And I do understand, again, don't get me wrong, I do understand some people really do have to work on Sunday mornings. It's just a way of life, unfortunately, at the moment. But if you have an option, work Sunday evening. Amen? Make a determination. Daniel made a determination. He didn't complain to all of the rest of them. He said, I'm making a determination and here's what I'm going to do. Because when you make a decision to do something, you don't have to have 10 other people with you. You don't have to have four or two other people with you. You can make that determination on your own. Amen? You can stand on your own word. You can stand on your own principles. Amen? Daniel stood on his principles and he determined he would not eat their food. Verse 9 says, now God had caused the official to show favor and compassion to Daniel. Isn't that amazing? They were trying to force food, sacrifice the idols on Daniel. And Daniel said, I'm not going there. I'm not eating that food. And he went to the official and said, hey, listen. Can you help me out here? I'm not going to eat that food. Can you do something for me? Now the official, he was following orders. He could have just said to Daniel, Sorry. But God had caused this unbeliever to show favor to Daniel. Why can't we today, with Jesus, why can't we expect God to show favor to ungodly people in our lives today? Amen? Let's not give out. Let's not complain. 
let's make a plan and let's stand on that plan. Amen? And we can expect the favor of God if we bring God into the situation. If we don't bring God into the situation, you can't expect the favor of God. Amen? Let's draw lines in the sand. Let's say this is as far as I go and I ain't going no further. We got to have red lines. Amen? We got to have a place where we said, nope, not going to do that. We have to make determinations. We have to make a plan. Because if we don't make plans, we will be swept away by the current culture flood that's in our world today. Constantly forcing us to compromise our faith. If we make a plan, we have something to stand on. We can bring it to God and say, Lord, help me as I stand on this plan. Amen? We don't make a plan. If we if we if we come out and say, "Hey, listen, I'm I'm going to stop eating sugar and keep buying chocolate and biscuits and cakes," we're not making a plan. If we say, "Hey, listen, this year I'm, I'm this month I'm going to get fitter. By the end of this year I'm going to be fitter. I'm going to be the fittest I've ever been." But if you don't make a plan to exercise within that time, well then you got to make a plan. Amen. We got to make a plan because if we don't make a plan, we're planning on failing. Daniel made a plan. Daniel chapter 6. Daniel made a plan and he had a practice. It says in verse 10, it says there in the second part of that verse, and it says, And in his upper room with his windows open towards Jerusalem, he knelt down on his knees three times a day and prayed and gave thanks before his God, as was his custom since his early days. One of Daniel's practices part of his plan was that he paused three times every day and he prayed. Nothing got in the way of Daniel's plan. Nothing got in the way of Daniel's practice. This is what he did three times a day, every day. He got down on his knees and he prayed. He had a plan and he had a practice. Amen? This was Daniel's plan. He wasn't going to let any directive because... In the story, if you read it, the king had been coerced into bringing out a plan that anybody who worshipped anybody but him would be put to death. But Daniel had a plan. And his plan was that he worshipped God three times every day. So he wasn't going to let anything, any directive from the king pull him off his plan. Second thing that we need to do is we need to trust God and his ways. Amen? Every one of us are going to end up in situations in life that that the world expects us to bend and bend the rules. You may have heard a saying, if you play with fire, you will get burnt, meaning that if you bend the rules too far, you will end up in trouble. How many of us here drive over the speed limit? Good answer. You know, on our uh, country roads, the speed limit is 80 kilometers an hour. And what we expected to drive on them? 90? But there's some good stretches there, so you can drive 90 on some parts of it. Uh, lovely stretch of road, great bit of road, we can drive 90 on that, can't we? On our major roads, the speed limit is 100 kilometers per hour. So that means we can drive at about 110, can't we? Yeah, about 110, great roads too. I mean, and if you're passing somebody, someone's slow in front of you. I mean, you've got to get around them, so you've got to do a little bit over the speed limit. You know, and you know what? If that's what you're doing, work away. But you can bend the rules. See how that works for you when you get pulled in. Or see how that works for you when you pass a speed van doing 110 in the 100 zone. When that letter comes in the post with the 180 euro fine and three points. See what kind of an excuse that will be then. I was just bending the rules. You know, if you bend the rules long enough and often enough, you will get caught. Simple as that. Amen? We were not called to bend the rules. We were called to follow the rules and trust in God's ways. Amen? There was 4,600 of Israel's brightest and best taken into captivity in Babylon. And only four of them didn't compromise their trust in the one true God. 
four out of 4,600 Jewish boys didn't defile themselves with the food of Babylon. The other 4,596 went with the flow. They bent God's rules. When in Rome, do as the Romans do kind of an attitude. We are not meant to live our lives compromised, blended into the world around us. We are called to stand out. Just because everybody else is doing it doesn't mean we have to do it. We were called to stand out. We were called to be different. And I'm not saying that you walk around with your I follow Jesus t-shirt on. I'm not saying that we should do that. But we are called to stand out in our communities. Stand out in our families. Stand out in our workplaces. Be different. Not weird. Please don't be weird. I've met a lot of weird Christians, amen, in my day who felt that to stand out they had to be weird. You don't. Just be who God made you to be, but just be mindful of all of what God has commanded us and told us to be in this world today. Amen? As Romans 12, 2 says, do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind that you may prove what is the good and acceptable and perfect will of God. We need to trust in God and His ways. Again, you all know the saying, a product of the environment that they grew up in. You know our kids, they speak English because they listened to us speaking English when they were in the pram. So they mimicked what we spoke and they ended up speaking English. As followers of Jesus, we are not meant to be conformed to this world. We are not meant to be just like this world. Amen? We weren't called to fit in. We got to trust God in His plan. When the Apostle Paul went out on his missionary journeys, he, he went out into environments that he wouldn't have been comfortable with. Being a Jew, he was, went out into this Gentile environment. So he would have been surrounded by all things that the Gentiles were. And in those situations, Paul would have felt the pressure to bend and go with the flow of the Gentiles. But he said that they were working hard to do what was right, not what was comfortable. Not only in the eyes of the Lord, but those who they were witnessing to. He said that in 2 Corinthians 8, 12. He said that they were taking pains to do what was right. Not only in the eyes of the Lord, but also in the eyes of man. Got to trust God in the plan, amen? God didn't say, well, you bend the plan to suit the environment you're in. No, you've got to trust God in the plan. And you've got to, in that plan, you've got to be, be so mindful of not compromising what God tells us to do, but also that you're not up in people's faces trying to force God down their necks. Amen? He said he was at pains to do what was right, not only in the eyes of the Lord, but also in the eyes of men. Amen? We need to be careful in our world that we don't tell the same jokes as the crowd do, use the same swear words or cheat the boss just like everybody else does. We're called to be different than the world we're living in. So how did Paul witness to the Gentiles that he was surrounded by? Well, 1 Corinthians chapter 9 and verse 19 is one of my absolute favorite passages of Scripture when it comes to witnessing. Let me read it for you. 1 Corinthians 9, 19, Paul speaking. He says, Though I am free and belong to no one, I have made myself a slave to everyone to win as many as possible. To the Jew I became like a Jew to win the Jews. To those under the law I became like one under the law, though I myself am not under the law, so as to win those under the law. To those not having the law, I became like one not having the law, though I am not free from God's law, but I'm under Christ's law, so as to win those not having a law. To the weak, I became weak to win the weak, that I, I have become all things to all people, 
so that by all possible means I might save some. I do this all for the sake of the gospel that I may share in its blessings. Paul said that I have become all things to all men so that I may win some. What does he mean by that? Well, he means that when he was talking to a fellow Jew, he talked to him like a fellow Jew. He acted like a fellow Jew around him. When he talked to a Gentile, an an unbeliever, he didn't stop being a God follower, but he talked to them in a way that they would understand. He used examples from their culture that they would understand. He didn't dress like he would when he was talking to Jews. He dressed like he would when he was talking to Gentiles. He said, I've become all things to all people so that I may win some. To the poor, he appeared like he, he, didn't, he didn't appear like he was rich. He came down to people's levels. You know when school teachers teach primary school kids, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten-year-old kids, they don't speak to them the same way as they would speak to you and I. That'd be ridiculous, wouldn't it? Imagine talking to a five-year-old the same way as you talk to a a 25-year-old. They wouldn't understand. What they do is they come down to their level. They speak their language. They explain things in a way to them that they will understand. Amen? All things to all people so that they may win some. It's okay to talk about football. It's okay to talk about the weather. It costs a living. But in all of our interactions, we've got to be very aware that one day we may get an opportunity to talk about Jesus. And we've got to still be in that position where we can. Daniel lived secure and distinct. In his surroundings, he lived secure and distinct. And he stood out in his surroundings. He lived fear. And free, fearless, because he was secure in the knowledge of trusting in the one that he followed, his one and only true God. And he trusted his ways to God. The same confidence Daniel had was the same confidence that enabled Moses to stand before Pharaoh, Esther to stand before the king, Paul before the empire, and Jesus before Pilate. Now, just for a minute, let's go back to Daniel again here. It says in Daniel 1, 9 again, it says, Now God had caused the official to show favor and compassion to Daniel. Do you know that in everything that you do, God is working out his will? Everything. If you trust in him and you give yourself to him and allow him to glorify himself in you. We've got to trust in God's ways. And finally, the last point. And probably the more important, you need to know your identity. You need to know who you are. Amen? You need to know who you are. If you know who you are, the world will not convince you that you are not who you are, if you know what I'm saying. If you know who you are, you will not be convinced that you should conform to the world, to fit into the world, because you know who you are. If you know who you are, you will not, the world will not be able to contaminate you to doing the things that it does, to thinking the way that it thinks. You need to know who you are and whose you are. Amen? You were bought at a price. You belong to Christ. You need to know that. When you go back into your work tomorrow, when you go back into your schools and colleges tomorrow, when you go back into your lives tomorrow, you need to carry yourself with a confidence that I know who I am and I know whose I am. Amen? The world doesn't own you. You need to know who you are. You need to know who you are. You need to be confident in the calling that Christ has in your life. Amen? Amen? in your workplaces, in your schools, and universities, you've got to carry yourself as not a follower of culture, but as a follower of God. When the world runs off in this direction, 
be okay to hold your ground. Amen? I remember years, uh, we, we still use it today, you all know the saying, you know, if everybody was to jump over the bridge, would you jump over the bridge? Speaking about, you know, if following the world, following what they do. We don't need to follow what the world does. We need to stand out from the world. We need to be totally secure in our identity. Know who you are, know whose you are. Romans chapter 12 and verse 2 again, the Phillips version. I'm going to give it to you again from the start. It says, don't let the world around you squeeze you into its mold. That's what it's doing. The world is trying to get you, it's trying to get our kids and teenagers and our young adults. It's trying to get them and it's trying to squeeze them into its mold. It's trying to force you to be what it expects you to be, what it wants you to be. Amen? But we're called to be distinct. You know what annoys me about restaurant culture today? Maybe I'm going off point, I don't know. When everything is the same, like chain restaurants, the McDonald's, the KFCs, all these chain restaurants, they're all the same, aren't they? I love something distinct. Do you? If you had a choice of a, a really good, authentic Italian restaurant or Chinese or Indian restaurant, one of these authentic places, you know, mom and pop places, you know, they're actually from China. They're actually from Italy. Or McDonald's. Which would you choose? I choose the, the, the distinct. Amen? Because I'm kind of gone really tired of every restaurant, every chain restaurant tasting the same. I like something that's distinct. Something that stands out. Do you know the most successful restaurants in our communities around us are the distinct restaurants? Amen? When you're taking your husband or your wife or your significant other out for a night, you don't take them to McDonald's, do you? Well, you shouldn't. You should take them to some place distinct. Amen? And we're called to be distinct. You know, we're called the salt of the world, salt of the earth, because we bring flavor to all of this. Remember who you are. You are Distinct. 1 Peter 2, 9, final scripture, it says, But you are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, his own special people, that you may proclaim the praises of him who called you out of the darkness into his marvelous light. Everything else in life flows from who you are in Christ, not who the world wants you to be. Amen?